be mean to me. Not being mean to you. Don't be mean to me. No, I just want you to show me your teeth again. Back to the He's Wrong, She's Right podcast. The only podcast where a woman is allowed to talk. That one wasn't good. Damn it. Just kidding. It's the number one rated most boring pack po- yeah, podcast. Hashtag boring AF. I can word today. Many words. Many words. Many words. Big words. Much good. Little pee pee. Such good. Today, we're talking about stuff that's going to come after I tell you that we're sponsored by the Amer. Oh my God. I'm so bad at this right now. America's Technology Center of Excellence, Lemax Media and LemaxMedia.com. With a transcript that's spelled L E M A C K S M E D I A dot C O M. And this one. And her insurance. You can talk to her on the phone if you call her and get insurance. We'll see. See, it's a it's a roundabout way of supporting the podcast. They can call you, get that personal touch. Mm. She'll be your agent until she's not. You won't get handed off to a bot. They're old school. I'm not AI generated and I'm not a bot. They still don't know that that's true. I don't know if any of our subscribers have ever seen you in person. And you've missed most of the most recent board meetings for soccer. Mm. So the board probably doesn't even think you're real. You're I my... am a figment of and, your imagination. And you you're a... not actually married. Did and, you know that? And you have a strange name. So you're my mail order AI bride. I literally have no words. Are you a robot? Feels like metal. You just wouldn't be able to hear it through the skin, would you? Cannot compute. Cannot compute. There you go. I'm just really that good at what I do. The, the America's Technology Center of Excellence. If you want a wife like that, hire me build one for you should i spend the next portion of our podcast faking it the way that you want me to fake it in the bedroom no oh andrew you're amazing (laughs) andrew i love you let me turn her off so is that what you want no but now we're back. And now we're back. Now we're back. Nope. Sorry about that. So I'm beating up your mic. So you sent me a text message with stuff that I'm supposed to consider for. Oh, you're not considering it. That is what we're doing. Okay, On today's episode, we are talking about horrible bosses. The movie? No. Or the, the du- duology? Is that what you call two movies? Duology? I have no idea. Well, we're talking about horrible bosses in our lives. Okay, if you say so. So, please, Andrew, share your first story. Why do I have to start? Well, I just talked, so it's your turn now. My boss sucked. No, actually, so, um, Larry made a comment when we were at his house. Who's Larry? Oh, oh, okay, sorry. When we were at his house on Friday. Okay. He said that he had read that people with autism and ADHD are more efficient and the the term that he used for it, I can't remember off the top of my head now, but essentially it was, we're better when we work for ourselves. Duh. No. Nah. I like working with other people. I just don't like the work that they produce. What? Okay. I have I've th- never heard you say anything positive about anybody else in the work situation i don't know about that okay anyways tell us your first story please andrew yeah. well i guess we could go back back to the far away years of 2007 oh we're going that far yeah being, atta- that- being what- attached to an mp unit oh isn't that one what is that one what yeah that's oh. what i was getting at was that was the start of your career in the army mm-hmm. well it wasn't a career okay lack of career mm-hmm. in the army so these blue falcons, as we like to call them, buddy fuckers. That's what a blue falcon is. If anybody calls you a blue falcon, that's an insult. These fucking blue falcons um, refused me, the company medic, one of the only medics for a period of time. They refused to let me go to sick call to get treatment for myself or my back which worsened things and worsened things. I ended up having nine incision and drainage procedures before 
they were finally like, hey, you know, um, this is probably a bigger issue. <laughs> you should probably go to Seoul to the army hospital there and have a surgeon look at you. So sure enough, I did go down for the surgery consult. And they also find left inguinal hernia at the same time, which mine hadn't fully torn. It was still small enough that it could have potentially been something I had all my life. But I don't believe that to be true because I got physicals every year growing up. I played multiple sports at every stage and always had to get a physical for school and even joining the army had to get a physical. And the army doesn't want you to have pre-existing conditions that they have to pay for. So generally they want to find those things and mark them down that you already have them. So even if they exacerbate it, they have an out. So I don't think that I had it going into the army. I think I developed it while I was in. Obviously neither of us can prove one way or the other. So I go down there, I have the consult. My battalion senior medic, there was no battalion senior medic or even brigade medic at all during this, most of this time. So we get our a battalion senior medic comes in. His name is uh, Staff Sergeant White. I don't remember his first name. He comes in and essentially drags the unit because he had come from line units and deployed multiple times, like had real leadership, not just these shitheads hiding in Korea to hide from deployment. Cause that's the thing that you can do. You can do, you can extend. So typically you're only there for a year, but you can extend and there's an, there's a financial incentive to it. So people want to do it for the financial aspect, but this is also at the height of both Afghanistan and Iraq. So there were people that would continually extend or reenlist to extend and stay there for three, four plus years. So that's the kind of unit that I'm dealing with. MPs were already shitheads to begin with. With some exception, the leadership was bad. There was a couple that I was not directly affiliated with. Some of the platoon leaders that obviously I was in HQ platoon because I was a medic. So I wasn't in like one of the actual line platoons. Um, like Gary Lowden, still friends with him, Facebook and stuff. I'm still friends with actually a couple of them. Um, but the actual like command group was terrible. Backstabbing the, basically it was like pathetic Game of Thrones. And I don't have any competition because there's not any other medic. So I'm just being dragged by assholes that want to control and manipulate their soldiers. Like I got in trouble so many fucking times for not telling the command and like staff call and command and staff meetings and stuff. Why soldiers were on profile. I'm like, even in the military, we still have to observe HIPAA. It's still a thing. I cannot tell you why your soldier cannot has to, has a shot soft shoe profile or why they can't perform X, Y, and Z, or why they can't carry certain weight, or why they're on bed rest. You can ask them, and they can tell you if they want to, or they can tell me that I can explain it, but I can't divulge that information because I'm covered by the same laws that civilians are for the same reason. So they, they hated me because, and this is my first unit, so I don't know what it's like in the real army, as we call it. I don't know if they generally just skirt that. I have no idea. Once your uh, exit from the army, what do you think the general consensus on that is? What? What? Did you ask the question? So now you're obviously out and you've obviously shared the story with other veterans. What do you think the general consensus is on that? Um, Just like we talked about in the other episode where there's always like some reason why people think it's warranted. So it's probably a mixed bag. If they like me, they probably are like, yeah, I can see that. And if they don't like me, they're probably like, well, it's probably your fault. Whatever. Okay. Cause yeah, my injuring my spine is my fault and trying to get care is my fault. No, no. I was talking about in regards to HIPAA. Oh no. I mean, I've observed it. Like I, I'm, pr as you've said, like I'm pretty big stickler for the rules for the most part. So I try and not put myself into positions where something could potentially be used against me, even in a joking manner. That's why, as you've said, I get like weird and awkward in certain situations. It's because I don't want something to be taken out of context and that be used against me forever. Like working in the emergency department as one of the only males most of the time. When they're all 
bantering and talking about, you know, patients and this and that or sex and everything like that. I've So you're saying that because I'm your wife, that's the only reason why you grab my boobs and you've never grabbed somebody else's boobs right. because they weren't your wife. Well, I mean, if they were my girlfriend, then that's okay. Right. But I'm just like, I'm trying to follow I'm where, where does, the, where does the line the, end? I'm talking about the banter and stuff. Like if I'm working in the emergency department and it's all female staff and they're all having, you know, telling raunchy sex stories or jokes and things like that, I completely avoided it. I did not participate. I would go do work somewhere else, avoid it at all costs. That way I never said the wrong thing in front of the wrong person at the wrong time. Okay. Anyways, back to the I don't MPs. I don't understand why that was hard to understand because that's back to the MPs. So I get back and we're supposed to have like the majority of the unit, maybe even the entire unit, is supposed to do a uh, an FTX field training exercise. We're supposed to be gone for you know a couple weeks, three weeks, or something like that. And this was in Korea. Yeah. What, what were you doing for three weeks? Training. I just said that. Right, but like up in the mountains like no what? um there's a place in the jsa called or i don't know if it's still there or not but it's called rodriguez live fire complex it's basically a town that's built in a valley so you do like simulated warfare training gotcha raiding okay. buildings capturing you know uh taking hostages the details matter rescuing hostages things like that so we're supposed to go and my recommendation from first of all the surgeon immediately puts me on a light duty profile okay meaning i can't wear my gear i can't pt i can't do anything essentially other than get up put my uniform on sit at my desk at the office go home rinse and repeat okay and recommends for immediate surgery schedules it out and i'm there this is a lieutenant colonel he outranks everybody in my unit no he's a full bird yeah he's a full bird colonel Outranks everybody, not just in my unit, but everybody above them and everybody above them. First of all, who do you think I'm going to take the command from? The highest ranking person or my unit? The highest ranking person. And then it comes down to my health and welfare. I'm picking my health and welfare other, you know, instead of going to the field with you. You can figure it out. So I get back. So I go and I have the first procedure done. This is, bear in mind, this is like for us, the equivalent of traveling to Raleigh to have surgery. Okay. And then, so having to travel there on your own, having to travel back on your own with public transportation because you don't have a car. So I had to travel to Seoul on a train, had the surgery. Nobody came to visit me. Nobody. The guys that you know, like Joe, they're in the field. They don't have a choice anyways. They couldn't just leave the field to come whatever. So right. down there, like the third day I'm getting ready to be released, they asked me if I have, you know, um somebody picked me up or whatever. And I'm like, oh, I'll figure it out kind of thing. And our battalion command is there in Yongsa. So I go and they're like, oh, well, you look okay. Cause I was like, I was on crutches. It's hard to walk, you know, everything like that. Plus instability, plus all the pain drugs and antibiotics and sutures and staples like this long down my spine and tough tissue repair, pulling everything together. So all the muscle was you know, contracting, I'm supposed to be, you know, limited movement, but you also want to be able to move. So first of all, they perform the, the wrong surgery for long-term health and long-term care. They're not supposed to do tough tissue repair like that. They're supposed to let the wound heal from the inside out. But because that time in the, in the army and in, in American military history as well, you know, we're at the peak of, I mean, people were getting like hundred thousand, hundred twenty thousand dollars bonuses for like two, three-year enlistments because they just couldn't get fucking bodies. So all of this is going on. You know, they, they're they not med boarding anybody. They're not medically retiring anybody. Like, they're just going to keep you in for as long as they can, no matter what is wrong with you. And they need to maintain readiness. You know, you have to go to the range. You have to do all this other stuff. So I'm basically falling into the category at this point where my qualifications are are coming to lapse. You know, I haven't had a PT test in X amount of time. So on the books, if you don't know who I am on the books, I probably look like a piece of shit to, you know, the eighth army division commander. I look like this black speck 
on the reports, it's like, hey, this guy isn't medically ready to deploy. This guy hasn't been in the range. This guy hasn't passed a PT test in a while. Couldn't fucking do sit-ups. How am I going to pass? So all of this transpires. I get back to my unit. I drop off my uh, convalescent leave packet at headquarters. I, I had to pay for a cab, by the way. I rode in a cab, laid on my side, two hours, all the way back. So I'm on convalescent leave. I think it was like maybe 12 days between surgeries. And a couple days in, this is pre-smartphones. Like we were still flip phones at this time. They're calling me, blowing my phone up. And I'm like, hey, I'm in the barracks. I'm in my room. I can't even get out of my fucking bed. I'm eating what people will bring to me, doing nothing but laying on my side, trying to recover, trying to get from... From spinal surgery. Yeah. Trying to get from the barracks to the aid station on Camp Casey and back every day or multiple times a day for wound care, bandage changes, because there's nobody in my unit that can do it. So I'm having to go all the way there and then come all the way back. It's riding buses or paying for cabs. Yeah. They did nothing to fucking support any of this. So around this time is when my battalion senior medic in processes and takes hold. And he gets in touch with me like right before I have my hernia repair. I go so this to... was about 10 days post-surgery from your first one. Yeah. Okay. So he's asking, you know, what kind of support the unit needs, like what supplies do you guys need to order? Can you put together a list of this and listen to that? And I, I'm telling him, I'm like, Hey, um, I'm on convalescent leave right now and there's nobody else there. I can't exactly do an inventory cause I can't even stand up. Mm -hmm. And so he comes up and he meets me and he's like, Oh, you know, this is kind of fucked up. So he finds a way to grab a couple other, because there's always people in processing into country and out processing out of country. So he finds a way, calls branch at the Pentagon. And is like, you know, we need more manpower in this unit. We've got guys, you know, that are down with injury, like this PFC that's been out of training for three months, just had spinal surgery and he's getting pressed to go to the field. He can't even walk. This is a fucking problem. Every unit that I was in had manpower problems, but that's also kind of everything in the military, especially with recruiting hurting and retention hurting. As soon as you tell a soldier that you don't want to give them the school or whatever that they want, you've effectively told them that they should just get out. And the cost, um, one of the guys on Twitter actually just posted this, the approximate cost to, to train a new soldier from basic training through their AIT is between fifty five and $100,000. To send somebody to a school like Airborne or Air Assault or some sort of ASI school like Flight Medic like I wanted to go to, we're talking like a couple thousand to 10, maybe 20, depending on the length of the school, the location of the school, transportation, TDY, housing, like all that stuff adds up. So you can either keep somebody in that you've already paid to train for five to 20 grand, or you can let them leave pissed off and then retrain somebody else to do the same job for three times as much money or five times as much money potentially. So essentially, you know, he's grabbing people that were supposed to be going to other units, pulling their orders, getting them, getting orders changed and stuff. And so finally we got, I got one guy, um, country kid, like great, you know, no issues with him. And as soon as I get off of, convalescent leave from the first, you know, I'll go, I have the second surgery. He comes and visits me. Battalion commander, battalion sergeant major, they all come and visit me. Everybody comes in. And then the day before I'm supposed to get out from the left of Guino hernia repair, my commander and first sergeant came. They didn't come to the more critical surgery. They came to that surgery. But because eyes were on them at that point. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't, they didn't fucking even offer to like, pick me up or anything either. They didn't send a patrol car to come drive me back or a TMP vehicle or anything. So once again, I made my way back in the back of a fucking Korean taxi cab in pain the entire time, still recovering from my spinal surgery, still have staples and sutures and everything in my fucking spine. And now I have metal mesh implanted in my left inguinal region. Literally can't walk now because I can't even 
bend my abdomen, having to figure out a way to crutch and have people, you know, help move me around and everything. I put on so much fucking weight because my entire routine for like 30 days was get up, have extreme pain trying to sit on the toilet to piss or take a shower because I couldn't stand long enough to piss even standing up. I had to sit down <laughs> trying to shower, standing up. There's no, there's no shower handles because you're not expected to be handicapped. There's no elevators. It's all stairs. And I lived on the third floor, so I can't even go to get food on my own. I have to rely on people who might be busy with something else. And they were banging down my door like every day. Hey, uh, we need this. We need you to do that. We need you to come in. I'm like, you, if you want to call the Colonel and you can have the conversation with him. And if you want to, you know, figure this out. So of course I become basically enemy number one because I'm, taking care of myself. And it's already a half-assed procedure to be owned. So around this time, I've already made my decision that I'm getting the fuck out of the army. These guys fucking suck. They're everything I do is under a microscope. That's why I went to EFMB the first time because I was like, well, I'm going to try, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight. I'm going to do this. I'm going to show that I'm a good soldier. Cause at that point in time, that's what I thought was necessary. I thought that I had to just be a good soldier. Not that I should take care of myself. Not that they were going to let me out of the army because I have major bodily harm. No, no, no. I didn't even consider that to even be a possibility. It wasn't even, there was no chance in the fucking world that I was getting out at that point. I didn't even know that people could get med boarded. I thought that you were just in until you weren't or you died. So you were quite literally being held hostage. Yeah. That's terrifying. So I go through all that. Command changeover happens. And end up with great but goofy commander and an awesome first sergeant who, I think I've told you this, every year on my birthday he messages me. We don't talk about anything else ever. So every, you saw the light at the end of the tunnel at that point? Yeah. Every okay. every year on my birthday, first sergeant Selleck messages me on Facebook and says, happy birthday, doc. Every single year. This has gone on since 2008. That's cute. So I go from there, go to RTB, and everything is completely different. Big boy rules, as we like to say, take care of yourself, you know. And on top of that, I'm in an actual medical platoon with 30 other medics and doctors and an actual surgeon that's in our unit and an actual MD that's in our unit. <laughs> so I don't have to go to the clinic or go to the hospital. I just go to our own aid station and say, hey, did this or I fucked this up, whatever, can you take a look at it? And some of our own medics in our unit at that time were already paramedics. Some of them were already nurses. Some of them, you know, various different levels. So the care there, not just for us within the unit, but also the care for the Ranger students is much higher elevated than was me training somebody how to start IVs or splints or, you know, things like that. There's only so much that even legally I'm allowed to train somebody else that I can't just do myself. That changes in a wartime environment, but peacetime environment, not so much. Like I could do sutures in the army as a civilian medic. I can't, it, you know, just everything has its own qualifier or reason why you can or can't do it. So yeah, I get there. Great leadership the entire time I was there. I mean, you saw the video of me doing CWSA. And then my squad leader was taking, he was talking to one of the other squad leaders, or actually I think it was our platoon sergeant. And he was asking if I was getting out or staying in. He was like, oh, I want to, I want to get him to stay in. I want to try and send him some schools. He's a good dude. And this and that, and like it was recorded. And he gave me the video. He didn't record that video to have that conversation, but it was like, I wanted to see me doing the events and he happened to have that you know, conversation. So, um, yeah, that was okay, if the army can be this good and the army can be that bad, I can't stay here forever. I'm going to get out. I'm not going to put myself in the situation because the options that I realistically had were to get into one of the other schools, like flight medic or go warrant officer and become a pilot, which I couldn't do because of my vision. Those were basically the only things that I wanted to do. So I decided to get out. The other option would have been to like go to selection. And I had no interest and going selection. Being a special operations 
medic slash surgeon would be fucking awesome, but it's grueling and the commitment is long. The school alone, if you make it through selection, is two years for 18 Delta. And that's like going through all of medical school, learning trauma surgery and procedures and things like that in two years. And then you're committed after that to another like six years in the Army. So by then I would have been at 12 years, which would have made me indefinite. And at that time I would have just had to stay in or what maybe I would have wanted to stay in. I don't know, but. I think you would have wanted to too. Maybe. And then we would have never met. Maybe. I might have still ended up here somehow. I don't think so. I've always had family here, so it's always a possibility. I wouldn't have gone to college in Indiana probably. I probably would have gone somewhere else. Well, who knows? We'll never know. So what's your story then since you had me talk about mine for so long? That's not the story I thought you were going to say. You have two other ones that are local to here that I thought you were going to say. Or are you going to say those next? Well, don't you want to tell a story? Or is this Andrew's story time? Andrew has much more adventurous stories than I do. My only horrible boss situation. Like, I'm, I, okay. So I've had three pretty stupid bosses um, in the last four years. And none of them to the extent of you. The first one used to pimp me out in every sense of the word. I was not authorized to drive these massive vehicles, but I was supposed to track down business owners and make them pay their bill just simply by putting my boobs out. And it worked every time. The next one is, mm, would it also essentially pimp me out, but <laughs> not in that way. It was more um, boobs out there to make us money for the company and make sure that you go all to these events and what's the do, difference between what I do right do now? Do anything on the podcast. necessary? Were my directions do anything necessary to seal the deal? And of course, I would not do that. But that's how she she was a woman. And I will only say that, um, how she grew her business and I was instructed to do that as well. And I refused and I also refused to continue working there for that reason. And then the most recent one who quite literally has a criminal record and went to drug rehab and everything for being drunk or drug because you just combined two <laughs> drug rehab okay um i'm pretty sure it was a situation um stalking of the i believe they were actually engaged at the time so not just girlfriend but actual fiance but stalking beating down her door um had to have daddy bail him out several times went to jail very very lovely human being um so i'm finally you free of you hope. all the horrible bosses and have finally found a really good genuine human i will tell um as a boss so yeah tell your story which one? Just the local ones? Yeah, the two the two local ones. You have uh, two local ones. So tell those stories. I was I was, I will be clear, I was intention intentionally vague on all of those stories and blurring them together for the audience so that way nobody can turn around and say that I'm being libelous or anyway. Libels, so. libels written. Slander. Oh sorry, slander, slander. Yeah. Um well, there's a transcript that goes with this. So, you so didn't write it. right. But yes, so I'm not intentionally slandering any of my previous bosses. I am just being very vague on I have so, left some very shady situations. So I was hired by a local medical company that specializes or specialized in incontinence care. At, not as a medic, though, not as a medic or nurse or anything like that, as their web developer. And I was hired through a uh what are they called um what's it called when you go and work is like a 
subcontractor through another, like a firm, hiring firm, whatever it's called. I know what you're talking about. Um... Yeah, that word, whatever that word is. <laughs> so I was hired through them and I did such a good job with everything and had knowledge and everything else. They were using a bunch of antiquated systems. They were, they were using, and this is a, it was, a, it was HIPAA and high tech violations, like up and down the fucking board. They were using non-encrypted, non-TLS, like basic standard encryption, like like you use in your personal Gmail, Yahoo, whatever you have, by default, you don't even pay for it. It's just, it's included. They were using just generic GoDaddy, cheapest, not even Microsoft or Google or any of those products. It was like what you can get as like a bare minimum package, one or $2 per month per user, without any sort of TLS or SSL encryption or anything like that. And they were emailing their client, customer, whatever patient information to include payment details, social security numbers, you know, everything, not just within the organization, but to the patients and to their caregiver and to Medicare and Medicaid, because that's who paid for a lot of this. And so I came in and I was like, Hey, um, we need to fix this. And they're like, well, how do you know that? And I'm like, cause I'm a medic and a nurse and I understand HIPAA and high tech because it's an, an important part of our training at basically every level. I don't even think you can become, you know, a, a CNA or anything in any actual corporate, like not like startup, obviously they could be stupid like these guys were, but you can't even, you can't even get in the door if you don't have that training or they're going to train you then and say, Hey, you know, we have to meet PCI compliance and HIPAA and high tech and all this other stuff. I had so much pushback on that initially. This is a guy that I don't even remember how he got his money. It doesn't really matter to the story. So, but he had lots of money. Yeah. So, so he could afford to make the change is the point. Yeah. No corporation wants to do it willingly. They want to get caught and then do it on the back end. as, Oh, oops. Sorry. They'll find a scapegoat. And be like, oh, it was the last guy. We already fired him. We'll fix it now. We have a new guy. So I basically convinced them, overhaul it. And then they hired me on full time temp agency. That's what it was. They hired me on full time. And essentially what they did is, and I didn't really think about this at the time. So the temp agency was taking a cut. Mm -hmm. So they were always paying the temp agency what they hired me on as to be. They're like, oh, we can pay you this much. Like, as if like right. I'd be happy about it, which I wasn't not happy about it. So I, I'm working for them in this and the VP to everything always has some sort of fucking pushback, some sort of pushback. So I finally convinced the owner and him that, you know, we did the website. We've, they were still using like spectrum, uh, cable internet, like, and I'm talking like the slowest of this like DSL speeds and they're using IP phones. So their phone calls or computers, everything that's going through the internet, there's like 24 employees who are basically using dial up complete nightmare. Mm -hmm. Their one of their old servers had been infected with ransomware. They just disconnected it and lost everything and just left it sitting in the server room forever. So I was trying to get those back up, you know, before I was, fired, but those they're probably still there because they probably don't know what, what they're worth. They're pretty, I mean, even these days, they're still. How much you want to bet they just threw them away? They probably did. They were good Dell enterprise servers. So I redid all their networking for the entire building. Reran all wiring, all new switches, everything. Got them to upgrade the internet to business class fiber, which even at that time wasn't that fast in that area of Wilmington. Not like even what we pay here residentially, pay for here residentially. But it was a quality of life improvement. Then talk to them about getting all new computers and not even all new computers, refurbished computers, but like 10 years newer than what they were using. They were still using spinning rust hard drives, 
mix match RAM. Everybody was on different versions of Windows. Different things were doing different things. People could just log into their own personal accounts on stuff, social media. So if you downloaded an attachment from your personal email, you could compromise customer information. Like absolutely no fucking security. And because they'd never been caught, stuff had probably happened, but they'd never been caught. And they never had anybody that knew how to audit it or do anything like that, that they just didn't care. Thousands of patients potentially were affected by this. So fast forward a little bit, like eight, nine months into me working there, and they wanted to acquire another competing company. So they they would sell and ship across the United States, but their bread and butter was Medicare and Medicaid. And in order to bill Medicare and Medicaid, if you have a retail outlet, that you sell, so say I have a product that I sell online for $10. I cannot bill Medicare and Medicaid $20. So if I wanna be competitive in retail, I actually have to have two separate entities, two separate tax IDs, two separate organizations. So they acquired a company, these people were retiring out of New Hampshire. I put together the entire plan for them to acquire like the technology assets, customer base, uh, you know, email, social media, everything, website, domain, all of it. And we get through that process, close on the purchase and everything like that. And then things start getting questioned. Why are we doing this? Why do we spend money on this? What are you actually doing here? You're running around fixing people's computers. We didn't have that problem before. No, you had the fucking problem before you just ignored it. So I go in one day. They called me in, already was suspicious of it. And because North Carolina is a one-party state, go in there and we start having the conversation about how my performance is bad and how I wasted company money and how this and that. And I had already filed claims with the uh, North Carolina Department of Justice, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, um, some other federal organizations. So I self-reported the HIPAA violations and that's actually, I don't know, maybe 24 hours before they fired me. Cause I, I sent them a message. I was like, Hey, look, like this is, I've said this forever. This is on record. I have this saved. It's everywhere. Like I have a paper trail of you guys telling me no to PCI, HIPAA compliance, everything. And I have self-reported 24 hours later in the conference room being told basically that I'm a piece of shit and all this other stuff. And I recorded the entire conversation. They tried to uh, say that I, so when I left, they, I was driving a company car at the time. So when I left, I had to have my grandma come pick me up because I didn't have another vehicle to be able to leave with. And they watched everything that I was, all my stuff that I was taking. They went through, the police even went through my book bag, everything like that. Get back, I was living over here at the time, pretty close to where we are right now, and start job searching again. By this time, my disability had just gone from 40 to 70, so I had a little bit of a, a decent cushion. And I went to the gym one day, and my grandma calls me, and she's like, hey, the the police were at, were at my house looking for you. And I was like, for what? And she's like, oh, I'm not sure. They wouldn't tell me, and I was like, okay. So then I get back to where I'm running, my landlord's like, hey, the sheriff's department was here looking for you. They gave this number for you to call. I was like, uh, okay. So I called them and they're you know, like, there's a warrant out for your arrest for this and that. I'm like, uh, do you have the wrong person? Don't understand what's going on at all. So I called an attorney, bail bondsman, stuff like that. Went down to the jail, county jail, turned myself in. Within a couple hours, I was back out on zero dollar bail because no criminal record, never done anything fucking wrong and drive back. And I've got like all the documents I'm reading through it. And they had given the police a bu basically a bunch of bullshit. They said that we had like, there was other equipment that we had ordered and I must've like taken it home and everything like that. And they came and they went through all my stuff and I had no equipment. Nope. They said that I had like three computers and all this other like company equipment. And I don't know if this is the, this way nationally, but I know in North Carolina, um, it's felony larceny for a penny. 
anything above a penny, penny and above, is felony larceny. So essentially, their attempt to discredit my HIPAA violation claims was to pin me as a felon. They withheld my final paychecks. They withheld my ability to file for unemployment and all this other stuff while all this went through the courts. So I get a public defender, do all this other stuff. I sue them in small claims court, have to go through all the criminal court stuff, go back through small claims court, all this other nonsense. And overwhelmingly, everything that they put together, they they essentially paid what I found out a little bit later on because I contacted the forensic agency. They paid this forensic agency not to actually audit them, but to give them a sample of what an audit would look like and then put my name in it. So when I went through all this evidence, so when we were in small claims court, I I handled this perfectly. My Because I self-represented in small claims. I give that to my public defender for the criminal court stuff. I had said this to you an, a, another time. Their attorney had to give me their evidence packet so that I could review it and respond to questions while we were there in court. This transpired before the criminal stuff. So I held on to his packet of evidence. And I went through all of that with a fine tooth comb. And I found every little fucking lie and bullshit. All of the IP addresses that they had that were saying that they were hacking into their systems were from various different consumer internet. Uh, like, so we have a static, we don't actually have a static IP address. We have a uh, dynamic IP address effectively it's static. It's never changed. My my IP address at the other house never changed. This one's probably never going to change because it's a key identifier for marketing and knowing what you do online. They don't want to give you a new IP address. They want to keep using this one because they know everything that goes through there is you and they can sell that information. So I go through this and there's like IP addresses from like Arkansas and Texas and all these other various places. And I track down the companies because this is all publicly available track down the companies, I get reports on how long uh, that IP address has been valid for that consumer. I obviously can't get the consumer information, but hey, how long has this IP address been used by this person in this city or whatever? That give me like an approximation. Nothing that would have, that would fit with a timeline of me using it or living there or having the ability to use it, anything like that. They're not VPN services. They're not private servers. They're not data centers. They were just random IP addresses that they were given in a sample packet and they just changed some of the verbiage and all this. And they had a really fucking scummy, well-paid attorney. The guy was making $17 million a year. Wow. So yeah. So by myself and with a public defender, I took down a fucking real piece of shit. And then just about two years ago, he was investigated by the FBI yep. and they reached out to you to yep. see if... Yep. If I had... Anything that I wanted to add, because that's uh, IC3, the Internet Crimes Something Center, FBI IC3 is what it's called. That was one of the places that I reported. It just took them that long to get on it? Well, uh, who knows? Who knows what they complied with? Who knows what they didn't? Who knows what happened after the fact? Because But his business is still up and running. But not as it was previously. Because they had where that tire center is now. That used to be a TV studio. That was the main building. The other building was like a... They were going to, they were actually planning on opening a pharmacy. That's what that building was going to be. Then they got scrapped and the pharmacy was going to be brought in house. They hired a pharmacist. We had a pharmacist, pharmacy assistant and everything. And to the best of my knowledge, nothing ever came of that. And now they just have that old florist building mm -hmm. and his in-laws live above li it. Yeah. Live or live. Yeah. Yeah. He used to have all kinds of shit. He had private planes. He had a big like man cave building out in the back. It was like a big in the back of the behind the main building if you're ever driving past it you'll see like the uh chain link fence gate where like the employees can park behind it if you look through there there's a big tree and behind that there's a big pole barn that he had built he had a whole like man law or uh, man, man cave law. man cave like suite built in there so yeah no, it's officially been renamed to man, man law. law so he had he had his own like suite where he could go to get away from his wife and kid or kids yeah I'm not joking. Like that's where he stored like his car collection, his motorcycle and man law. Yeah. All right, Andrew, tell us your next story with another POS. Bob. Oh yeah. Uh, well, we're, 
pushing 40 some odd minutes. So, okay, I'll try and make this one fast. So that was around Veterans Day-ish, 27, yeah, 2017. Um, within like a couple of weeks, I was hired on at a web development agency here in Wilmington as one of their lead developers. And they had like three companies. They had an IT company. They had a uh, real estate, not a real estate agency, but they did um, real estate photography, videography, tour, virtual tours and all this stuff for agencies that wanted to have, you know, hire out instead of using whatever they have in house or doing it with their cell phone. And worked there for a bit and started noticing some stuff as I was working on purchasing my house that we're currently selling. Weird things coming up, clients wanting to leave and being mad at me that I couldn't do certain things for them. And I started getting calls from other local developers. They're just taking a shot in the dark because they don't know who I am and I don't know who they are. So they would call me and explain, hey, I built this site for this client couple of years ago, obviously I no longer work there. It's a conversation for a different day. If you'd you know, want to come and get lunch with us sometime. And I did, I ended up going, meeting up with a bunch of his former employees with a bunch of current employees. And we learned a lot of just shit. This guy was basically upside down every way possible. These clients were trying to leave for better service or better rates, or they wanted something updated and they were basically being held hostage. Their intellectual property, their domains, stuff that they paid for, stuff that they own, stuff that has their name on it. He was holding a hostage, either for a dollar amount or as negotiating leverage or both. And this other, these other individuals would already have something new put up and ready. And all they needed was an access token to transfer the domain out of ownership of the company that I was working for to ownership of the company that owned the intellectual property, not even to themselves, like not even to the new developer, but to the company that actually should own it. And I've said this a million times. I don't allow my clients to do that. They own everything. It's never an issue. They want to leave and go somewhere else. They're more than welcome to. I don't hold anything hostage. You own your own shit, go somewhere else, figure it out on your own. Sometimes I'll help them transition. Sometimes they've already done it behind the scenes, sometimes they have it. And then they try coming back afterwards and they're like, oh, and I'm like, no, I'm sorry. You know, I'm busy right now. Tried to tell you, you didn't want to listen. So you can learn the hard way now. See in a couple of years when you come back again. And that has happened. So a couple of months of that goes by. And of course I have USA so I can, he cuts paper checks to everybody on payday. So I have USA. I would get my check, sign it right there on my desk at the end of the day, scan it in on my phone, leave, no big issue. Well, he started missing payroll. He started not paying for servers and services that clients relied on, like his own hosting servers. His cards would be declined, this and that. I would get calls from clients asking why their website's down because his credit card was maxed out because he was using company credit cards for personal purchases. And then he would be reading off numbers to me over the phone, trying to figure out which card has enough balance on it to pay for an AWS server or, yeah. He had at one point for, I don't even remember what it was for, something with AWS. He owed them nearly $100,000 and he had it set up on a payment plan that he had to chip away at while still accruing new charges. That sounds exactly like the first boss that I mentioned. Yeah. For me, but yeah, carry on. And so of course he's having to give me access to certain things because, you know, two factor authentication was finally starting to get a foothold at this time. So you have to log into somebody's actual account to get access to actual payment details. Like you can't just delegate that to somebody. And I'd see some of the stuff. I'm like, what the fuck? Like and by this time, you know, I'm in the house hunt found a couple of places, started making offers. And some of my other coworkers are texting me and being like, Hey, my check bounced, my paycheck bounced, which is a crime. I, I don't know if it's a felony specifically, but I know it's 
because that's a corporate crime. So I don't know if there's felon. I don't, I don't know the law like that, but I know it's um pretty big deal. You have to always have the money to cover payroll no matter what. So start getting those kind of phone calls. I'm like, no, but I'm also typically the first to deposit my check. It's probably why if you had gone to the bank before I deposit my check, it might've been the other way around. And yeah, so everybody else kind of started bleeding off one by one. They started finding other jobs. The, some of the IT guys went to work for banks. One of them works for, um, oh my God, it's, it's a, they're a contractor for the U S air force. Cause he's a, uh, IT security professional. And actually he's one of my clients. <laughs> I still have three of his sites to this day. Oh, wow. Um, so even though this was a terrible boss and a terrible work situation, you actually made some really good connections. Yeah. And yeah, so as soon as I closed on my house, that recording that I think I played for you. No, you never played it for uh, me, but you did talk about it. It's like 45 minutes of and then what did you do with it? I called a company meeting with all seven people remaining. Mm -hmm. Well, what did I do with it? He sent an email that he had me on the company's email marketing list. So I received it. And the way that he did it was he, because he used cheap and didn't want to actually pay for real services. So instead of even PCCing or using a marketing service to send out a mail blast, he CC'd everybody. Mm -hmm. So I was CC'd on an email about you to not just customers but everybody that he's ever touched mm -hmm. everybody whose email address he had ever collected and then what did you do with it i responded back with an attachment of the audio recording to everybody who was cc'd in that email yeah hey, if you want to listen to what really happened listen to this that was good yeah he was trying to tell me that because i was a veteran that i should i should do better and all this stuff i'm like don't tell me what you're not even a fucking veteran you piece of shit don't tell me about ethics and morals when you're fucking scamming your customers. And bouncing people's paychecks. Yeah. Like at one point he owned that, that nice building, the whole building. He had it built, owned it. They had departments on every floor. When I started working there, they only had the first floor. I didn't think anything of it. He was renting up, renting out offices on the second floor to various different, there was like a concrete company that had an office. There was like a, an attorney that had an office. I didn't think anything of it. I didn't know what the company was like before. I didn't know how many people he did or didn't have. So I kind of came in at a weird time. Yeah. So then closed on my house and I was like, see ya. Yep. And then those two bosses met each other because I had talked about the medical company while I was there. And what happened with that? Oh, he threatened me. He was like, oh, I know all this stuff about you. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know lies. Like, what are you going to do? You can't even can't even afford to pay your attorney for your divorce. You're selling off all of your properties and you're filing for bankruptcy. Good luck and fuck you. Do you remember, um, oh my God, there's an actor. I can't think of his name. No, no, it's not an actor. Have you ever seen King of the Hill, the cartoon? Yes. The grandpa that was like in Vietnam or whatever. And he's like, he like walks like vaguely it's been at least 25 years since i've seen king of the hill yeah basically it was a human version of that guy oh my god <laughs> it's how he walked and everything and everyone that female wise that was around him attractive or not was basically there because he had money at one point and then when he no longer had money they no longer wanted to be around him there were when i remember going on I had to go on his computer to help him with something. And he had like his Amazon account, the corporate Amazon account open. And he had stuff that he had ordered for himself for these and like his date for the Azalea festival on corporate card on the corporate Amazon account. And I just didn't like, he literally left it open on the computer. I'm like, dude, what the fuck? And then as the IT guys are leaving, he's like, Oh, oh don't you know how to do some of that? Don't you have, aren't you Google? Can't you help them? And I'm like, aren't you Google? That's essentially how you would talk. Yeah. And no, I'm not going to fucking help you. Fuck you. I would help the customers. And I did mm -hmm. and a lot of, you know, not all of them, but several of them left. I had people that hadn't been customers with him in a long time that responded. They're like, yeah, he's a real piece of shit. I actually had one guy. I don't remember the guy's name. I'd never met him. He called me one day when I was at the gym and actually it was a, he's a either owned something, some law firm 
So I thought I was getting a call from some attorney and I was like, okay, I'm going to listen to it. I'll record the call. Well, it's this former partner of his that he was trying to open some other business venture with and he was basically scamming him. Mm. And he's like, hey, so can you tell me about this, this and this? And, you know, do you know what happened with this money and what his finances were like? And so we had a whole like two hour long conversation outside my gym years ago. Like not in person. I was on the phone. Right. And yeah, that was like, that was the last I ever heard of it. So I don't know whatever, yeah, but <laughs> I gave him other people to contact and mm. that's, you know, probably pieced it together. And my piece didn't go back far enough because my piece was recent history and not how fucking scummy this dude was to, to put it in perspective. He had no business being in any of these businesses. He just had the money to, he had opened a typewriter repair shop. And that's what this business evolved into. He had had to change the name of the company at one point. And somebody else had given him the idea to use like a specific number. And he just liked that number it had no relevance to the organization when it was founded or anything, but he thought that it would make it look like the company had been around for longer. Yeah. But that definitely dates him a typewriter repair shop. Yeah. I cannot even think of one in existence currently. Yeah. This guy was borrowing money from everyone, grandma, everywhere. Your grandma, yeah. everybody's grandma. Yeah. Mm, he sounds like a lovely human being. He's pulled off. I don't know. I still think the other guy is definitely worse. This guy is definitely scum of scum, but the other guy is scum of scum. Mine are all just like surface scratches compared to your deep wounds. You know what time it is? Time for you to get a watch. Yep. And time to end this. Amazing episode. Okay. Goodbye, everybody. Bye.